So Monday, March 27th is a day that I will never forget. Um, I walked out of that office at 10 o'clock that morning uh, to drive around the precinct and the initial call came out and immediately my stomach dropped when I realized it was a school. For the first time, we're hearing from Nashville police officers who responded to the deadly Covenant school shooting. You could clear as day tell that there were rifles, uh, rifle rounds being fired. Three children and three adults were killed on March 27th when a shooter opened fire at the Nashville Private Christian School. Minutes after first responders arrived to the school, the shooter was shot and killed by police. Those officers now being hailed as heroes. They were so in tune to trying to get in and take this threat down, they didn't think about their own safety. Surveillance video captures the shooter arriving at the school at about 9.53 a.m. At 10.10 a.m., video shows the shooter entering the school after firing at the glass of two double doors. Three minutes later, the first 911 call came in to dispatch. By 10.24 a.m., first responders were on the scene. Minutes later, officers Rex Engelbert and Michael Colazzo opened fire, killing the shooter. The first responders that responded, Rex Engelbert, Mike Colazzo, and Sergeant Mathis, did what we were trained to do. They formed together, they got prepared, and went right in. Knowing that every second, every moment, wasted could cost lives. Officer Rex Engelbert says he was outside of his normal service area on the morning of March 27th, putting him closer to the school than he usually would be. You can call it fate or God or whatever you want, but uh, there, I can't count on both my hands the irregularities that put me in that position. A call for service came out for an act of deadly aggression at a, a school. I immediately uh, turned on my lights and sirens. Engelbert was one of the first officers to arrive on the scene. He says Covenant School staff gave him a key to the building. I've been given my training. I, I know my role. And uh, I made entry with, with the personnel I had. And luckily I had some. I saw there were patrol units and I, I asked for people to join me as I had a key. Let's go! Good evening, I'm John Yang. The ominous weather forecasts and warnings came true for a large section of the country as a massive line of severe weather wreaked havoc from the deep south all the way north to the Great Lakes. At least 21 people have been killed and an estimated 85 million people were in the path of the storms. From two twisters in a wide open Iowa field. Dude, stop! To a funnel captured up close by storm chasers. The outbreak of severe weather was intense. The system brought hail and even snow. There have been multiple deaths in Tennessee to the east of Memphis and in the small town of Wynn, Arkansas, which took a direct hit from a tornado. Residents were left stunned. I'm speechless. This is no words. We can't say nothing. I, this never happened down here like this. And for it to happen, yeah, it's, it's, it's no words. In the small town of Sullivan, Indiana, the mayor said parts of the community are unrecognizable. Cities and towns, big and small, were hit hard. On Friday, a tornado made its way through Little Rock, Arkansas, population 200,000. Sirens blared, warning some residents in the capital city to seek shelter. Others relied on a signal from nature. The only way we knew the tornado was coming, the leaves were swirling. That's the only way we knew. It looked like it was standing still. Someone said, run to the back. Me and these two ladies here, we ran to the back, we huddled together, and we prayed for our lives. Drone footage over parts of Little Rock revealed the scope of the damage. Roofs ripped off, entire buildings flattened. Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders spoke to reporters in front of one of the city's fire stations, itself in the tornado's path. 
I've had the opportunity over the last uh, couple of hours to speak with both the Homeland Security uh, Secretary as well as President Biden who have offered uh, a tremendous amount of support, anything that Arkansas needs. They have assured us that those resources will be here and on the ground and we really appreciate their willingness to help Arkansas out. Alex McFarland is a leading Christian apologist. If you're wondering, that doesn't mean he apologizes for the faith. It means he defends Christ's history and shows why you can trust it. To get there, he first explains what historians want. They want eyewitness testimony. They want multiple testimony. They, they want early testimony. And the fourth is hostile testimony. As for eyewitness and early, the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are by men who either knew Jesus in the flesh got their facts from eyewitnesses, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others. Paul's epistles are written by a man who encountered the resurrected Christ. We have got the Gospels coming to us from less than 10 years after the cross. Compare that to the 643 ancient copies of Homer's Iliad, whose authenticity scholars don't question. But from the time of the writing to the copies we have, more than 500 years, in fact, around 900 years. We've got the Annals of Caesar, which comes to us in several dozen copies. But again, from the earliest copies we have, the time of writing, nearly a millennium, a thousand years. Compare that to the main facts about Christ. The core of Jesus' identity message credentials was in circulation regularly within eight weeks after the cross. As for hostile testimony, or at least not pro-Christian, many outside sources wrote of this Jesus. A worker of wonders did miracles, claimed to be God, crucified at Passover, the core facts of the gospel, death, beauty, and resurrection, just based on ancient Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources that certainly were no friend to the burgeoning church. That's very compelling to historians because it represents objectivity, that those no friend of the movement also corroborate the core facts of what we know about Jesus. In devastated Wynn, Arkansas, where four people died, Pastor Marvin Norman described driving his wife through what was left of their community. Told me she said, turn around, take me home. She said, I can't stand it. She said, take me home. As many as 52 tornadoes left a path of destruction across America's midsection and east, killing dozens. This EF3 tornado tore through the Arkansas capital of Little Rock as a driver caught in the middle of it had to ride it out in his van. 100% didn't think I was going to die once I saw the winds pick up the way they did. In the small town of Adamsville, Tennessee, nine people lost their lives. Praise the Lord. We're, well, we're alive. We're alive. Misty Gardner and her family sought shelter in their basement when a tornado hit and destroyed their home. I was watching my husband. He was down on his knees praying, and I was listening to him pray. I was just <laughs> saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, please keep us safe. Northwest of Chicago, a roof collapsed at this concert venue, killing one person. Joe Biden has declared Arkansas a major disaster area. In Wynn, Arkansas, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders praised the recovery effort. Obviously, this is just an unbelievably tragic moment for our state, but what I found to be so amazing are the people who are stepping up, not just from this community, but across all of Arkansas. Operation Blessing assessment teams are on the ground, meeting with pastors to begin distributing and serving food, water, and other relief supplies to their communities. Well, switching gears to another story, there's hope for California, and his name is Jesus. That was the message preached all over the Garden State, the Golden State, rather, this past weekend at Hope Fest. Thousands were saved, baptized, and as Griff Wendy Griffith reports, given a mandate to preach the gospel. I grew up in a lesbian household with two moms. I had never heard the name of Jesus. 28 year old Ross Johnston was a test tube baby and raised by two lesbians. Sunday in LA, he told the crowd of young people it's time for their generation to be bold for Jesus. Scores rushed the stage to dedicate their lives to the Lord. 2020, when all the craziness was happening in America, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. If you don't stand now, Ross, when will you ever? Here at Hope Fest LA, many Gen Zers received their marching orders to preach the gospel, heal the sick, 
and love their generation back to Jesus. People are looking for their meaning in life, all the wrong places, and then we get to encounter them with the solution, which is Christ, you know? I'm a missionary, and I see like all the ins and outs of what's going on, what Jesus is doing, and even just behind the scenes, it's just crazy um, how much revival is happening. 26-year-old Joel Mott says Gen Zers are looking for something real and aren't afraid of a challenge. We were made for this, you know? Like, we were made, like, in the face of corruption, in the face of darkness, like, this is who we are as believers. Like, we are the ones who shine the light of Jesus. Today, Ross and Joel run CaliforniaWillBeSaved.com and go around the state preaching and worshiping in places outside the church. There was a couple walking to a satanic ritual. They walked by, they heard the worship, they heard the gospel, got saved and born again right there on the spot. I'll never forget it. And it was during that time that the Lord began to give me vision for California. Hope California was birthed from a dream where evangelist Mondo Matthews saw 10 stadiums in 10 regions of California filled with people seeking Jesus. Sunday, that dream became real. We've seen hundreds baptized, hundreds saved, healed, delivered, and it's just been incredible to watch all the way from the top of Sac from Sacramento to San Francisco, all the way down to La Paz in, in Baja, California. It's been incredible. This generation needs to be saved. It has to be saved. If we don't, if we don't save this generation, we lose America. I love this post that I recently read on your Instagram that says God is bringing revival to prison. I understand that many people are coming to Christ through this ministry. Talk about what, what God's doing inside the prison walls. Yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. Specifically, uh, since COVID, we launched a, a new form of technology, the first ever third-party app uh, behind prison walls, which is basically a Netflix, if you will, of faith-based content that uh, allows inmates and their family members to engage uh, with the local church uh, on a 24 seven basis. Uh, they have access to sermons, worship musics, devotionals, guided prayers, anything that somebody may need uh, in their spiritual life. They have access through a tablet uh, within their cell 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so uh, we've seen a tremendous uh, amount of decisions for Christ over the course of the last two years. In fact, there were up over a hundred thousand uh, that have said yes wow. uh, to Jesus. And so it's absolutely amazing. And those are real people clicking a button. They can only click it one time. So uh, they are they are uh, really accepting uh, to follow Jesus behind uh, prison walls. And they're engaging uh, with the spiritual content on a daily basis. In fact, uh, we have somewhere over uh, 14 million hours watched uh, on the app already, which is absolutely remarkable uh, when it comes to uh, technological data. So. God. I love the fact that NFL quarterback Russell Wilson and his wife Sierra recently took part uh, in a God Behind um, Ministry outreach and others like Maverick City, Kirk Franklin have also been involved. What's that been like for the inmates and what's the impact that we're seeing with them? Yeah, it actually gives them a, a, a uh, something to hold on to, something to look forward to, a hope uh, that there's people out there who are remembering them and their situation. Uh, that are able to come in and share their testimonies, their giftings, their talents, uh, and, and find them uh, to be worth their time. And so I can tell you uh, right now what that does in the life of an individual uh, is life-changing. Uh, it's something that will forever mark them. Uh, we've seen hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of people give uh, their life to Christ during those events, uh, and someone using their platform uh, to ultimately fulfill their purpose and point it towards the glory of God. Praise God. And Mr. Bodine, we've also seen those uh, wonderful, amazing videos, those joy-filled family reunions at prisons. What is the process for reconnecting children with their incarcerated parents and for helping inmates re-enter society? Yeah, that's one of uh, my most favorite things that we do as an organization. Uh, as a father of five children, I know what it would mean to me uh, spending any time away from them, let alone some of these individuals' years. Uh, and for some of these men or women, meeting their children for the very first time. So uh, our, our team takes it serious. Uh, it's not just about the focus of an individual uh, who's incarcerated, but uh, they're literally legacy that they're going to leave behind them. Uh, we want to amplify uh, their role as a spiritual guide in their child's life. And so 
Uh, beyond them coming to a uh, weekly service, uh, we want to help uh, shape what God's already doing in them to be able to share that with their kids uh, and ultimately transform their legacy as well. And so we host these different events throughout the year uh, that allow for mom or dad uh, to spend a quality amount of time in a quality environment uh, with their children, a lot of them being introduced for the very first time ever, but uh, the majority of them being introduced for the ver first time in a very long time. Uh, and just seeing these families reconnect, seeing these parents uh, have the value uh, and responsibility of being that role model in their child's life again uh, is not only life changing for the individual, but uh, it is literally uh, impacting legacies, generational legacies, uh, and, and enabling them to be Christ filled legacies. It's a hubbub of daily life where buses jam up against Skull Hill, where the Via Dolorosa is packed with people too distracted to think about God. I've come to appreciate all all the more how vast his sacrifice to come down from glory into this world and love all these people too busy to notice him. And he died to save each and every one. After his resurrection, Christ was seen off and on by people for the next 40 days. And then many believe ascended from this side on the Mount of Olives, the same mountain where the Bible says he'll return in might and majesty. As Matthew says of those days, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The story's not over yet. Some believe Jesus was crucified at the base of the hill behind me, now home to a bus parking lot here in Jerusalem. Well, 2,000 years ago when Jesus was hanging on the cross there, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When as a new Christian I read that, it really shook my faith because it kind of sounded like Jesus was losing his. Well, when you find out what's actually going on with those words, rather than shake your faith, it may well supercharge it. Jesus was quoting Psalm 22, verse one, word for word. While he could hardly breathe up on the cross, with those few words he was saying, go read Psalm 22. Since it was written a thousand years before Christ's birth and also before crucifixion was invented, Psalm 22 is an amazing prophetic look at exactly what would happen that historic crucifixion day, down to the tiny details. I went through it verse by verse with Bishop Art Pierce of Baltimore, Maryland's Rock City Church. First off, Jesus knew he wasn't being forsaken. He volunteered to make this blood sacrifice because as the pure Lamb of God, he was the only one who could take away the sins of all mankind by shedding his perfect blood for them. He was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's the purest Lamb there's ever been. There was no pure blood than his blood. But because a holy God can't be in the presence of sin. And he was turning his face because he couldn't look at sin. King David describes Christ on the cross declaring, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, by night, and I'm not silent. Pierce points out how Christ was crying out from the cross, both in the day and night, as God turned the world dark for three hours. Well, when darkness came on the earth, it says, and there was thundering and lightning, and the earth shook. Verse 12 says, strong bowls of nation encircle me. That's likely symbolic talk for the beefy, bull-like Roman soldiers who tortured Jesus and nailed him to the cross. By the way, when it says strong bulls encircle me, the phrase is better translated crown me. Remember it was the Roman soldiers who jammed a crown of thorns onto Jesus' head. Jews in that day referred to Gentiles as dogs. And verse 16 says, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Psalms 22, a thousand years in advance, perfectly describes Roman Gentiles nailing Christ's hands and feet to the cross. Before that was ever even thought about. Verse 18 says, they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. King David prophetically describes the Romans both dividing and casting lots for Christ's garments. And his description of the agony caused by crucifixion is eerily accurate. Verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. All your liquids run out of your body and they go to your feet. Verse 15, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. He would have become so parched of mouth, he was losing his liquids in his body. Verses seven and eight say, all who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let the Lord rescue him. Then listen to how Matthew 27 describes what actually happened. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, and the elders mocked him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him. David had a divine revelation and you can no longer, once you read of Psalm 22, you cannot separate it 
from the crucifixion. Verses 30 and 31 conclude the psalm by describing a faith going on into the ages, saying future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Well, the FDA has reportedly uh, set to announce plans to approve a second updated COVID booster. According to the New York Times, the authorization for that shot is expected to come over the next few weeks. People 65 and older would be able to get it as soon as four months after their last shot. But according to the CDC, less than 17% of the population actually chose to get that booster shot, which was approved back last August, 17%. Yeah, and a really important development for a lot of people who are at risk still of COVID, still very present. Right, especially those we mentioned, age 65 and older. Welcome back. This morning, tensions in Jerusalem are running high after a series of violent escalations between Israelis and Palestinians. Yeah, overnight, Israeli police stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site for Muslims who are marking the holy month of Ramadan. Militants in Gaza responded with rocket attacks, setting off a wave of Israeli air strikes on Palestinian territory. NBC News correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Jerusalem with more on this. Raf, all this comes during one of the holiest times of the year for Muslims, Jews, and Christians. So walk us through what triggered this latest round of violence and why did the Israeli police storm that mosque? Yeah, guys, good morning. We're looking out over the Al-Aqsa complex. It is peaceful right now, but this morning it was anything but. Israeli police say they stormed into the mosque because young Palestinian men had barricaded themselves inside with improvised weapons like rocks and fireworks. And it led to these almost unbelievable scenes. You can see Israeli police in riot gear hitting people with nightsticks inside this holy site. You can see Palestinian men shooting fireworks inside the mosque itself. And you can hear Palestinian women screaming, oh God, oh God. And the reason these Palestinians were inside the mosque overnight, they say, is that they were preparing to defend it from Jewish extremists who they fear were preparing to sacrifice an animal here to mark the start of Passover, which sounds crazy. It sounds like something from the Old Testament. But a fringe Israeli extremist group has been offering as much as $8,000 to any Jew who does successfully sacrifice an animal at this spot and that is something that Palestinians see as a completely unacceptable desecration of the mosque. Guys. Raf, really disturbing images you're talking about. Help us to understand why this site in Jerusalem is so important both to those who are Jewish and those who are Muslim. What is the status quo agreement in place and is it being adhered to? Yeah, so the status quo agreement is this fragile deal that governs how this holy site is shared. And remember, to Muslims, this is Al-Aqsa. This is the third holiest site in Islam. To Jews, it's the Temple Mount. It is the holiest site in Judaism. And under this so-called status quo agreement, Jews can visit here, but only Muslims can pray here. And for some more religious Israelis, that is seen as unfair. They say religious freedom dictates that anyone should be able to worship here and in recent years we have seen ever larger numbers of religious Israelis coming to visit the site including some provocative visits like the one earlier this year by a far-right minister from Netanyahu's government a visit which really raised tensions here in the Middle East guys good evening and welcome to the news hour two stories have dominated this day escalating Israeli Palestinian confrontations appeared to move the Middle East closer to a broader conflict. And the Biden White House put out its long-awaited report on the widely criticized fall of Afghanistan in 2021. First, Afghanistan. U.S. forces hastily withdrew in August 2021 as the Taliban recaptured the country after nearly 20 years of war. Amid the chaos, a suicide bombing killed 13 U.S. troops and more than 100 Afghans. Today, the National Security Council's John Kirby laid out a 12-page summary blaming the Trump administration, bad intelligence, and the Afghans themselves. Our Laura Barone Lopez had a seat at today's White House briefing and joins us to break down the report's conclusions. Thanks for being here. What does this 12-page after-action report say? So this is a, a report compiled by the National Security Council based off of the after-action uh, reviews conducted by the State Department and the Defense Department. So there are a number of key findings here from this actor after action report. That includes that the administration will now prioritize earlier and faster evacuations, uh, something that was not done in the withdrawal during of Afghanistan. They, they also say that the 
President Biden was significantly constrained by the Trump administration's decisions in the four years prior. They also did not expect the ease and speed of the Taliban takeover, and that from here on out, they are going to use more aggressive communication about risks, acknowledging that there was an intelligence failure there. But despite all of these findings, the administration still said that the president stands by uh, the withdrawal and thinks that it was the right decision. And in terms of any additional reports being released, they said, no, not, not so far, that ultimately they are giving these reports to Congress, the classified versions of them. Our other lead story tonight, clashes between Israeli police and Palestinians at a Jerusalem holy site have spilled over into Lebanon. The Israeli military says Hamas or Islamic Jihad militants in Lebanon fired 34 rockets into northern Israel today. Trails of white smoke from those rockets streaked over the city of Nahriya. The Israelis said they shot down 25 of the rockets, but at least two people were wounded in the barrage. Late tonight, the Israelis began airstrikes against targets in Gaza. A short time later, sirens sounded in Israeli towns near Gaza, indicating new rocket attacks. In the day's other headlines, thousands of protesters engulfed the Tennessee state capitol as majority Republicans moved to oust three Democratic lawmakers. Representatives Justin Pearson, Gloria Johnson, and Justin Jones had led anti-gun protests from the House floor last week. Today, their supporters surrounded the Capitol building and crowded inside as the trio, with raised fists, entered the House hand in hand. The calls for gun control have grown since a school shooting in Nashville killed six people, including three children. The Biden administration moved today to block states from outright banning transgender athletes in school sports. The proposed rule would allow limited exceptions. It was issued as the U.S. Supreme Court allowed a transgender girl in West Virginia to compete in girls' sports for now. A lawsuit in her case is pending. China vowed today to take forceful measures after Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen met with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy Wednesday in Los Angeles. Chinese Coast Guard and naval vessels sailed north and south of Taiwan today. But Beijing said Washington and Taipei are the ones making trouble. The United States and Taiwan are colluding with each other to condone Taiwan independent separatists to engage in political activities in the United States, carry out official exchanges, and enhance substantive relations between the United States and Taiwan. This move seriously violates the One China principle. Last August, after then-House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, China conducted its largest live-fire drills in decades. French President Emmanuel Macron was in China today, urging President Xi Jinping to help end the war in Ukraine. The two leaders and their delegations met in Beijing. Macron said he encouraged Xi to persuade Russia to stop the fighting and negotiate peace. L'agression russe en Ukraine a, a porté un coup. The Russian aggression in Ukraine has dealt a blow to stability and put an end to decades of peace in Europe. I know that I can count on you to bring Russia to reason and everyone to the negotiating table. We need to find a lasting peace that respects internationally recognized borders and avoids any form of escalation. Macron also said President Xi agreed that there can be no use of nuclear weapons in the Ukraine war. While Macron was in China, an 11th day of mass protests raged in France after over-raising the retirement age to 64. Crowds marched in Paris and other cities to voice their opposition. Their overall numbers were down, but police fired tear gas to disperse some who turned violent. The demonstrations came after talks between unions and the government failed to yield any progress. Back in this country, the Republican governor of Idaho has signed the nation's first abortion trafficking law. The measure bars adults from helping a minor to get an abortion without parental consent. That includes obtaining abortion pills. Penalties range from two to five years in prison, and offenders can be sued by the minor's parent or guardian. Sudden death among healthy working age people worldwide is skyrocketing. Here in America, it was up 40% during the third and fourth quarters of 2021. Our next guest contends a 10% jump would have been a one in 200 year event, but this was 40%.
Edward Dowd is a founding partner of Finance Technologies and author of the new book, Cause Unknown, the epidemic of sudden deaths in 2021 and 2022. Okay, Edward, most people would respond to this sudden death news and say the statistics jumped 40% because of COVID-19. What do you say? Yeah, so in 2020, it was mostly old folks who died of COVID with comorbidities. Then there was a sudden mix shift in 2021 and 22 and continues in 23. And my uh, work and my partner's work points to something that happened with the employed of our country it's been detrimental to your health to be employed in 21 and 22. And we examined this, the Society of Actuaries, which is an industry group for insurers that does surveys. In August of 22, they came out with a survey uh, for their group life policyholders. And group life is a specific policy for those who onboard to Fortune 500 or mid-sized companies. You get this uh, death benefit as kind of a freebie when you are on board and you you know you get one or two extra salary. Should you die, you get that, your family gets that or your beneficiary. You have to be employed at the time you get it. Well, this is a great business for insurance companies. And in 2021, the whole industry experienced 40% excess death in uh, ages 25 through 64. The millennials 25 through 44 were, were hard hit particularly. The group life policyholders generally die at one third the rate of the general U.S. population in a given year. And in 2021, I just said they, they had 40% excess death. Um, the general U.S. population had 32% excess death. Well, it seems and, like, uh, tell us about some of these unexpected sudden deaths. It seems like there are a lot of them. I mean, just look from a Google search, you can find like a lot of 12, 14, 16, 18 year olds that are just dropping dead suddenly. I moved here to Israel not long ago and thought it'd be interesting to experience Easter by visiting the places where Jesus lived, died, and rose again. The Easter week began at Beth Phage on the Mount of Olives. There, he mounted a young donkey to fulfill Zechariah 9, 9. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. And on this day we call Palm Sunday, Matthew tells us, as Christ reportedly rode on this route, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But there are always critics and killjoys. Luke tells us some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Christ then entered Jerusalem triumphantly, though he soon began to raise a ruckus. This might be one of the areas near the temple where Jesus threw over the money changers' tables, saying, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And Mark tells us it was then that the religious leaders began to look for a way to kill him. Why? Because he was threatening a way of life that had made them wealthy. Several days later, for the Last Supper, Christ came to a room said to have been on this site. Breaking the bread and pouring the wine here with his disciples, he gave us communion, which we still take today. Jesus and the disciples then returned to the Mount of Olives, where he told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and all the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he admitted, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He went alone to pray that this cup might pass from him and he sweat tears of blood, a condition that supposedly only happens to those who know they're about to die. Then Jesus appeared with an armed crowd and betrayed him with a kiss. And all his disciples fled and deserted him, just as he prophesied. Back in Jerusalem at a courtyard, some say this one, Pontius Pilate tried to save Jesus, but caved into a mob whipped up by the high priest into shouting, crucify him, crucify him. This is the Via Dolorosa, which marks Christ's tortured last walk the next day. So weakened from beatings, he fell beneath the weight of his cross. Some say that led to this area where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has reportedly covered Golgotha, the place where Christ was crucified. Others point to this hill outside the old city where many see a skull in the rock. And Golgotha does mean the place of the skull. You can make it out a whole lot better in these photos taken long, long ago. Skull Hill is also next to a garden with a tomb built into a wall. So this might well be the place where female followers of Christ showed up on Easter morning, only to be told by an angel, do not be afraid. You come seeking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, but he is not here, for he is risen. 
In all the controversy about whether these or those are the actual spots where Jesus was, I've learned if you'll tune all that out and tune into the Holy Spirit, you'll feel how real all these events in Christ's last days were and that they really did take place right here in this city. We begin this morning with breaking news out of the Middle East and the escalating tensions there. Yeah, early this morning, Israel launched more airstrikes in the Gaza Strip, along with strikes on targets in southern Lebanon. The attacks in Lebanon were reportedly in response to rocket attacks on Israel yesterday yesterday from militants in that region. Meanwhile, the attacks on Israel from Gaza are showing no signs of letting up. The ongoing violence between Israelis comes during one of the holiest times of the year for people of Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faiths. Zinkley Stephen, the violence started this week at the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex here in Jerusalem, but it didn't stop here. And this morning, this chaotic situation is spreading across the region from Lebanon to Gaza to the occupied West Bank. Just breaking it down, this morning the Israeli military says two Israeli women were shot dead in the West Bank. A major manhunt is now underway for the shooter. And this coming after Israeli jets pounded targets in Gaza and unusually in southern Lebanon overnight. They were hitting facilities belonging to the Hamas militant group, which Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says was responsible for this barrage of rocket fire we saw from southern Lebanon into Israel on Thursday. Now, 34 rockets were fired, 25 of them were intercepted, but this was the largest barrage we have seen since the 2006 war between Israel and the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah. Now, Hamas is a Palestinian group, it controls Gaza, but it does also operate inside of Lebanon. And the Israelis, when they were carrying out these strikes, were trying to find a balance between going after after these Palestinian groups like Hamas without triggering a full-scale war with Hezbollah like the one in 2006, which was so devastating. Now, you can hear behind me, Muslim worshipers are back at the mosque for Friday prayers. We're in the middle of Ramadan here. But on Wednesday, Israeli forces stormed inside this holy site, the third holiest site in Islam, and videos of Israeli riot police beating Palestinians with guns and nightsticks, sparking fury all across the Muslim world. Israeli police say they had no choice but to go in after extremists barricaded themselves inside the mosque. They were stockpiling rocks and fireworks. So a very volatile situation here all across the Holy Land as we head into this Easter weekend. This is AP News Minute. Access to the most commonly used method of abortion in the U.S. plunged into uncertainty Friday following conflicting court rulings over the legality of the abortion medication mufepristone. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on Saturday said an appeal is in the works and that, quote, our very first action is to make sure that this does not go into effect. The U.S. Navy has deployed a guided missile submarine capable of carrying up to 154 Tomahawk missiles to the Middle East in what appeared to be a show of force toward Iran. The U.S. has accused Iran of targeting oil tankers and commercial ships in recent years, as well as a series of tense encounters at sea. China lashed out at the World Health Organization for its latest accusation that China withheld crucial data concerning the origin of COVID-19. The director of the China CDC said at a media conference that China provided all the available information during a weeks-long joint study on the pandemic's origins in 2021. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Those prayers for peace in the Middle East are nowhere near answered as tensions remain high this weekend. This past Holy Week has been marred by violence in the region, from Israeli forces beating Muslim worshippers in a mosque to deadly attacks on civilians from Palestinian groups. And that's on top of Israel's growing political instability. Taria Israel looks at the situation and the latest escalation in our top story tonight. Easter, Passover, and Ramadan all coincide this year. Three holidays happening in the shadow of heightened tensions. The Israeli military says its warplanes struck Syrian army sites in retaliation for a rocket attack. A Palestinian group based in Damascus claimed responsibility, calling it retribution for the storming of El Aqsa Mosque. <laughs> Israeli forces entered the Muslim holy site last week, beating worshippers. 
On Sunday, the situation was calmer, but still uneasy. Palestinians performed prayers inside Al-Aqsa as Jewish worshippers walked up to the site they call the Temple Mount. In the occupied West Bank, mourners gathered at the funeral of two British-Israeli sisters, killed when a suspected Palestinian gunman opened fire Friday. They died the same day a car rammed into a group of pedestrians in Tel Aviv, killing an Italian tourist. Palestinians also buried their dead. The family of a 20-year-old man says Israeli soldiers shot and killed him during clashes. What happened is a crime against this town, says his uncle. Israeli forces hate our young men. The last time there were mass protests. Mira Sukarov is a political scientist who studies the conflict. The flare-up also comes at a time when Israel is facing unprecedented turmoil from within. Anti-government demonstrations are sweeping the country against what protesters call a power grab by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition right-wing government. There can't be democracy, which is the term they're chanting in the streets, democracy. There cannot be democracy without it being democratic for all, including the Palestinians under Israeli control. Political instability and growing uncertainty during a sacred time for Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Speaking of a sinister ecosystem, we can hardly mention that without talking about hospitals. Hospitals, I don't know when they became prison wars or when they started focusing on harming patients, but we are definitely there. One of the nation's top children's hospitals has generated controversy over a video claiming that some children know their gender identity before they are born. That's so, isn't that, can I just pause there for a second? It's remarkable. So we are being told that they're not human beings, which is why it's totally fine that Planned Parenthood is aborting millions and millions and millions of them, right? It's totally fine that we're harvesting organs. It doesn't even matter because they're, they're not real. But also they know their gender identity. Those not real things that are in your stomach know their gender identity. Yep, Boston Children's Hospital posted a video on its YouTube channel in August where a psychologist explains that a good portion of children she sees at the hospital's gender multi-specialty service clinic, whatever that is, they know their gender identity from the womb. Yep, this is the video. You should take a listen. So most of the patients that we have in the GEMS clinic actually know their gender, usually around the age of puberty, but a good portion of children do know as early as seemingly from the womb, and they will usually express their gender identity as very young children, some as soon as they can talk. They might say phrases such as, I'm a girl, or I'm a boy, or I'm going to be a woman, or I'm going to be a mom. Kids know very, very early. So in the GEMS clinic, we see a variety of young children all the way down to ages two and three, and usually up to the ages of nine. When they come into the clinic, they'll see one of our psychologists and we'll be talking to them about their gender, we'll be talking to their family about how to best support that child and how to make sure that that child has the space and support to explore their gender and uh, do well throughout their development. And we'll be answering any parent questions. A lot of parents do have questions and so we answer those questions. The biggest piece of advice I give parents uh, who are coming through the gender clinic at Boston Children's Hospital is to just be supportive. Um, sometimes you might not understand, sometimes you feel like you don't know the terms or you don't get exactly what the child means when they say that they might be this gender, but the biggest thing you can do is just love your child and support them and just allow them to express themselves. That's the biggest protector as well against negative mental health effects such as depression, suicidality, anxiety that we worry about for our gender diverse kids and young adults. So that support from a parent is one of the best protective factors and one of the best things they can do. I almost have no words for this. I really just want to say that I hope that in watching and in paying attention to this, what we have done is played a part in waking parents up. I just, I just hope parents are now realizing just how evil this world has become. Joining me now, Riley Gaines. She's a spokeswoman with the Independent Women's Forum and former swimmer at the University of Kentucky. Riley, I mean, the president also said the event was deeply traumatic for the students, but not for you who was actually assaulted, apparently. Your response tonight to what you just heard. 
I mean, you can't even make this up exactly like you said. This is what higher institutions are, are doing, universities, where children are going to learn. This is what they're teaching them. Um, they also responded in the email with saying, you know, we know how hard it can be to hear other perspectives. So here are some counseling resources um, for, for you students who were so brave. My response is we must have different definitions of peaceful because these videos, what I heard, what I endured for three hours sitting barricaded in a room where they demanded money if I wanted to safely make it home, that is not peaceful, that's kidnapping and extortion. Now, Jamila Moore, as I said, that staffer that sent the email out to the students, Riley, following your event, also said that we value different ideas even when they're not our own. But then yesterday, you tweeted that it was this individual, Jamila Moore, blocked you on Twitter. <laughs> so what happened to the exchanging views and the beauty of the exchange and the tolerance and the inclusivity? What happened to that? You know, the DEI stuff, it only works if it's in agreement with what they're pushing. Because in reality, diversity is racism. Inequity, it's, it's segregation. These, these ideas they're pushing, it's not indicative of what the messaging is that they're using. It's manipulative, it's violent. This whole movement, it's vengeful, it's hateful. I've, I've never seen a movement quite like this movement. And, you know, I've stated this from day one, even when I was on the campaign trail, I'm a computer geek. And I believe that technology is here. Uh, we cannot be afraid of it. And as the commissioner stated, uh, transparency is the key. And the two pilots that we are rolling out today to see how they fit in our public safety environment is matched with the DigiDog, a robotic dog that could be used to save lives. It was something that was introduced previously, previously under the previous administration, and a few uh, loud people were opposed to it, and we took a step back. Uh, that is not how I operate. I operate on looking at what's best for the city. And the three we are mentioning today is only the beginning. We are looking at uh, the new forms of public safety. I have put Deputy Mayor Banks and our entire Matt Frazier, my chief technology officer. We are scanning the globe on finding technology that would ensure this city is safe for New Yorkers, visitors, and whomever is here in this city. Do you think I'm evil? Evil is in a clinical diagnosis. I'd like to ask about why you brought me here. Do you believe in demonic possession? No. Well, you don't believe anything you want to tell you. Then give me something to make me believe you. Okay. Let me inhabit you. He got in your head, didn't he? He claims he's a demon. He's a master manipulator. By the time he's done with you, you have your head so twisted around you think you're the killer. Before you leave here today, you will have committed three murders. Why would I do that? What, what, what are you doing? My name is Nefariamus. Names are important. They have power. They let everyone know who we are. 